We're going to continue our conversation from last time about neuroplasticity and ultimately what type of effects can we expect from hyperbaric oxygen with regard to brain and central nervous system healing. And also today I want to talk a little bit about other modalities that we might want to combine in the attempt to help patients through some type of neurodegenerative or acute traumatic event to, uh, to brain tissue. Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain and central nervous system to grow and repair and regenerate nerve cells, nerve tissues, and specifically to create new synapses. Because ultimately, our, our ability of our body to survive, but more importantly, thrive in the environment that we live in is the ability of our body to send signals back and forth. Here's a changing environment that we're living in. We have to, uh, we have to sense those changes from all the different senses that we have in our body. We then have to send those messages up to our brain. Our brain has to understand what is happening in that exterior environment or the internal environment, and then create normal, healthy, and appropriate responses in order to make sure that we're having a healthy response to our environment. So I said last video that our quality of life is literally directly related to our quality of our synapses, the quality of the connections between our nerve cells and our ability to carry that information from one end to the other in order to understand the changes and then have appropriate responses. Our brains can go through many periods of neuroplasticity. During early development in utero, we go through neural pruning and we change a lot of our connections and synapses. During early development as an infant, we also have tremendous amounts of neuroplasticity and neuroplastic changes that go on inside of our body as our body's learning the world that we're growing up and living in. We also need to go through neuroplastic changes anytime there's damage, trauma, chronic inflammation or illness. If we can't heal properly, reduce inflammation and heal and recreate old synapses or create new synapses, new connections, then we're going to be left with whatever deficits are accumulated throughout our life from the different traumas or different illnesses that we're exposed to. And so our ability to create neuroplastic change throughout our entire life is critical for us to be able to maintain a high quality of life throughout all of our years so that we can heal and regenerate this central nervous system throughout each injury or illness that comes our way. So I alluded to this earlier in the last video, but whether we're talking about post-stroke, which was a little bit more of the focus last video, or other issues that happen to our brain like an acute concussion or traumatic brain injury, a TBI, or a chronic illness like Parkinson's or CP or MS or dementia. So many of these brain-related issues, one of the underlying causes of the long-term consequences of these issues is that in the time of that illness or in the time of that trauma, there is a moment of hypoxia. As our brain only makes up about 2% of our body mass, but uses at least 20% of all the oxygen that we bring into our body. If there's a moment of hypoxia, all of a sudden the area of brain that needs a tremendous amount of oxygen in order to make the energy it requires for a normal function, as that oxygen level comes down, we have an immediate decrease in performance and function of that same tissue. If that were to persist for any length of time, those cells would ultimately die. And so as an attempt to preserve the cell from dying, the body will ultimately either downregulate the function of that area or potentially make that area dormant. And so the cells are alive, but they're not producing energy and they're not functioning at the level that a typical neuron would. And so the question is, can we reinvigorate? Can we wake up those dormant cells? Can we restore normal function of the cells that were injured in that process? And then ultimately, can we heal and recreate new connections with nearby cells so that we can start the process of brain and central nervous system regeneration? So what are some of the hallmarks of many of these chronic illnesses or these chronic brain traumatic events? Well, there are quite a few. One is that there's an increase in oxidative stress. Two, there's this period of hypoxia. Three, there's a down-regulation of ATP synthesis. Four, there's usually a breakdown of angiogenesis. There's typically also a period of neuroinflammation that occurs along with the potential for myelin to be broken down. These are some of the commonalities between many of the chronic degenerative uh, illnesses that affect brain tissue. What type of effects can we expect from hyperbaric oxygen with regard to brain and central nervous system healing? Hyperbaric does a lot. Hyperbaric 
could normalize the oxidation in the area. One of the effects of long-term hyperbaric use is increasing the body's intrinsic antioxidant system, which helps to rebalance the oxidative and reductive pathways in our body. But basically what that means is it helps to reduce the free radical damage inside the body. If myelin is being affected, your myelin is a fatty sheath, which is a lipid, and lipid oxidation or lipid peroxidation is what it's called. Hyperbaric has a tremendous effect reducing lipid peroxidation. We know that. That's very well documented. And so anytime there's myelin damage from the oxidative process, we know that hyperbaric can create a neuroprotective component that helps to save and salvage that myelin and potentially help create an environment where that myelin could be repaired. We also know that hyperbaric will obviously come in and hyperoxygenate an area. So if you have an area of hypoxia, the immediate introduction of increased oxygen will create hyperoxygenation, meaning bringing more oxygen to that area. And as we bring more oxygen to that area, we can typically increase mitochondrial function, increasing the cell's capacity to produce energy. We also know that hyperbaric has a tremendous anti-inflammatory effect. It's able to reduce the inflammatory cytokines. It's able to increase the our body's own anti-inflammatory cytokines. And it's able to start creating balance. Certain cytokines are called regulatory cytokines, and they help maintain the balance between the anti-inflammatory and inflammatory process. And we know that hyperbaric also increases the regulatory cytokines. So it's able to affect inflammation threefold, both reducing the inflammatory chemicals, increasing our body's own anti-inflammatory chemicals, but also improving the capacity for the regulatory cytokines to do their job. And lastly, when there is damage to the capillary system, and the capillary system is ultimately how we get red blood cells, thereby getting oxygen to whatever tissue we're talking about, that damaged capillary bed needs to be repaired. After all your therapies are completed and the body is healing and the person is recovering, you want that tissue to be able to oxygenate itself. And the only way that that's ever going to be self-sustaining is going to be rebuilding of the capillary beds in that area. And we know that hyperbaric not only can help heal the endothelial lining, the inside lining of capillaries and arteries, but it also helps from an angiogenesis standpoint, it helps regrow entire capillary beds. And so if there were trauma or damage to an area and that damage had capillary damage, which it often does, restoring those capillary beds so that that tissue can now self-oxygenate once all other therapies are removed, allowing that patient to continue to heal and recover and repair for many years ahead that ability of uh, the rebuilding of the capillary beds is a critical component to the entire process of uh, healing for these patients. So between all of those factors, and as we mentioned last video, the fact that we know that there could be up to an eight-fold increase in central nervous system stem cells, hyperbaric plays an enormous role in not only clearing out the damage and inflammation, but the repairing and regeneration of those cells and tissues. And if we can create enough healing and regeneration, we will start to stimulate improved neuronal connections and either repair synapses or create new synapses so that we can ultimately restore the normal flow of information from the outside world into our body, up to our brain, from our brain back down to our body, and make sure that all of our analysis of what's going on inside and outside our body and our responses to those changes are all healthy and appropriate. Now, that being said, what else can we do to really help restore neuroplasticity or to improve the quality of the signaling inside of our body? Well, there's so many pieces to it, but some of the most important, I think, impactful processes would be cellular metabolism. How could we affect that cell's ultimate help, bringing in nutrients, processing the nutrients, creating the energy, and getting rid of waste. Just like oxygen could play a critical role in the energy production, so does the food that we eat. We know that brains don't burn fat the way the rest of our body could. So for many, many years, even when I was back in school uh, in exercise physiology, we were always told that the brain can only burn glucose as a source of energy because it does not have the capacity to burn fat the way our muscles do or the way our livers do. And that's only partially true. It's true that the brain does burn glucose and really does not have the transport to bring long chain fatty acids through the blood brain barrier. And so as a result, neurons don't burn fat the way the rest of our body can. However, the brain does have the capacity to burn ketones. And so in many cases in our clinic, 
when we're dealing with either chronic or acute brain issues, we will be using hyperbaric oxygen because we know that oxygen plays a huge role in this process, but so does the fuel. And so many of these patients will be put through a process of ketosis, ultimately to help their bodies learn how to fast properly so that we can create ketones because although the brain doesn't burn fat, it can burn ketones. In fact, there are studies that show that the brain tissue preferentially will burn a ketone over a glucose molecule when given the choice. So creating the environment of ketosis along with this environment of oxygen, both of those together really increases and impacts mitochondrial function, which will increase the body's capacity to make energy. What else can we do? We can use methylene blue. Methylene blue is an electron donor. So it can really also help push the energy production through the process from start to finish, helping to create more ATP in this area. We can also use targeted red light. Targeted red light to certain areas of the brain can stimulate cytochrome C. That's another huge part of that electron transport chain. Again, allowing the body to increase the capacity to make energy. So if we can change the fuel, get the brain off glucose, get it burning some ketones. If we can add some electron donors like methylene blue being one of them, you could also do NAD precursors or NADIV. We could also add CoQ10 and red light, which are all going to be part of that electron transport chain stimulation that allows for that mitochondrial function. And then we drive higher than normal amounts of oxygen into those same cells. We can start putting all the pieces of energy production back together as they heal and as they recover from either the trauma that they were exposed to or the potential disease that they're still in the process of uh, fighting and healing from. So I hope that helps. I'm going to include a few of the papers that I pulled this information from so that uh, anyone interested can go look those papers up and check those out. Any questions, always feel free to shoot them my way. Uh, I love making videos about the questions that you have. It just, if you have that question, I'm sure somebody else out there does as well. And so that just helps us formulate what kind of information is most helpful for you. And ultimately, the only reason we make these videos is to get you guys the information that you need, that you're looking for to either help yourself, help a loved one, or if you're in a practice, help your patients. Please subscribe to the channel. Please like the videos. Please share the videos. Again, that's, it's all about sharing this information and getting the truth out there so that the people who need it can find it. And then ultimately, the patients are going to have the results that they're looking for. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.